Welcome to the Independent Advisors Podcast, where we dive into the world of stocks, tradable markets, and financial planning with Jessup Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer, Mark McEvely, and CEO, Matt Jessup. You'll hear tips, tricks, and strategies to address your financial well-being, and most importantly, conveyed in a way that everyone can understand. Here are your hosts, Mark and Matt. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode number 196 of the Independent Advisors Podcast, where Matt Jessup and I, Mark McEvely, bring you everything you need to know from the past week in the world of financial markets and financial planning. So good morning, Matt. Good morning, Mark. Uh, as always, uh, we will begin uh, the first few minutes to recap the performance for the month and the year of the major indexes that we track. And these numbers are as of the market close on April 12th, and this data is from YCharts. S&P 500 index is down 0.4% for the month and up 6.6% for the year. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 1.1% for the month, up 1.5% for the year. NASDAQ Composite Index down 2.4% for the month and up 14% for the year. IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF, is down 1.4% for the month up 0.8% for the year. And the Vanguard All World X United States ETF is uh, up 1.1% for the month and up 7.8% for the year. Three month treasury rate at 5.02%, two year treasury rate at 3.95%, and the 10 year treasury rate at 3.41%. So pretty big move up in the three month um, treasury yield, Matt. I don't remember seeing that over 5% uh, since we've been doing this podcast weekly. Yeah, I think there's expectations that the Fed might have uh, one last hurrah in it um, on May 3rd, I believe, is the date, is their next Fed meeting. Meaning you think they're going to hike again? Well, that's what the market's telling you, right? But um, I can definitely say if you look at um, Fed fund futures on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, it's expecting interest rate cuts in the second half of the year. And as I've said now for uh, many weeks in the podcast, the debate in the second half of the year will be that topic. How long they pause and when they eventually start cutting. Right, right. Uh, and you heard it here first, folks. Kind of, and kind of related to that, we had uh, March CPI that was released uh, yesterday. Um, And you can add uh, some content to this after, Matt. But uh, readings came in uh, below expectations. So again, CPI is the Consumer Price Index, a popular measure of inflation in this country. Um, And Ben Carlson had an interesting tweet uh, yesterday after CPI was released. And he said, the last 10 annualized inflation readings. In June, it was uh, a little over 9%. And now in March, it's at 4.98%. And every month since June, that number has come down. Mm. So it's gone from 9 to 8.5 to 8.2 to 8.2, 7.7, 7.1, 6.4, 6.4, 6. And now in March, uh, under 5%. So two replies. Two replies. First reply is a couple podcasts ago, I shared some statistics about how stocks going back many decades perform in four different environments. Rising inflation, falling inflation, rising interest rates, falling interest rates. And three of those scenarios, stocks tend to do good. As a reminder to listeners that might have missed it, what's the one scenario where stocks historically have not done good is in a rising inflationary environment. A lot of people, I think if I quizzed them, they'd sit there and say, well, It's that one and when interest rates are going up. Not true. My second comment is, look at the recent um, acceleration to the downside that when the data came out a month ago, it was at 6% year over year, and we came at 5% year over year one month later. Wow, if that's not dropping like a brick, in the month over month change, 0.1%. 0.1%. Get out your ruler. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. So uh, I have a piece on this about inflation in the Fed is my last piece. It'll be fun. And I'll tie this right in, in, the bill, in a little bit. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, moving on to tweets, articles, and research from this week. First thing I had was uh, 
shocker, another tweet from Ryan Dietrich on uh, March 31st. And this was kind of similar to the data point that you provided last week, Matt, but just a little different because um, it's not looking at what happened last year. Okay. Uh, but he says, this is interesting. When the S&P 500 gained more than 7% in Q1, the full year, again, has ne never been lower. That is 16 out of 16 times the full year finished in the green, up 23.1% on average. Um, so again, interesting just, years in this data set too. Do you see some of these years? Yeah, 2019, 2013, 2012, 98, 95, which 95. came after a bad market in 94. Right, right, right. 85, 86, and 87, and 83, coming off those really high inflationary years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Pretty yeah. interesting. It's very interesting. So uh, Ryan's just been throwing out a bunch of data. Um, that's pointing to all things that this year should be well into the green. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, second item I had, Matt, uh, was an article by Harry Sitt titled, No FDI Insurance, Why a Brokerage Account is Safe. And I'm just reading that headline. I'm not saying that a brokerage account is safe. That's just the headline of the article. Um, so I thought it was an interesting time to kind of discuss the differences because People might have the question, given everything that happened uh, with the banking system over the past couple of weeks, um, you know, is my money that's in a brokerage account FDIC insured? And uh, that answer is, is, is no, simplistically. So he gets into a little bit and says there's a big difference between having money at a bank and having money at a broker such as Charles Schwab, Vanguard or Fidelity. Money at a broker isn't insured by the FDIC, but it isn't like uninsured deposits at a bank. When you have money at a bank, you have a lender-borrower relationship with the bank. The bank borrows money from you and lends money to others. When you have money at a broker, the broker is only buying and keeping things for you. They do have it in a safe, so to speak. Your money is in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, etc., there is an exact mapping between what the broker says you have in your account and what the broker keeps for you. The broker doesn't invest your money in longer term bonds for itself. When you have cash in a money market fund at a broker, the money market fund invests in very short term bonds. When you're getting a four and a half percent yield in a money market fund, the yield is coming from the underlying holdings of the money market fund. It's not coming from the broker. Brokerage accounts are insured by up uh, by SIPC up to five hundred thousand dollars, but the insurance doesn't cover the payback from your investments. It only covers missing assets if the broker goes down. If customer assets aren't missing, the SIPC insurance isn't needed. And I think you'll like this, Matt. When yep. Lehman Brothers collapsed in two thousand and eight. Lehman's brokerage customers didn't lose anything. Lehman Brothers lost a lot of money from subprime loans, but it didn't steal from its brokerage customers. All the customers' assets in Lehman brokerage accounts were properly segregated from Lehman's assets and liabilities. The brokerage customers just transferred their holdings to another broker. Yeah, and so just to kind of add to this, to be very direct, SIPC coverage in very direct terms means if you got 50 shares of ABC Corp, you're going to have 50 shares of ABC Corp. It has nothing to do with how ABC Corp performs. So it's not guaranteeing anything along those lines other than if you have 50 shares of some security, then you have 50 shares of some security. My second uh, item is um, there are a lot of uh, brokerage uh, houses that uh, pay and provide SIPC coverage in excess of that standard coverage that you mentioned. And um, I know there's some that provide, quote, unlimited coverage. Um, and so, you know, some of the bigger boys, and I'm not going to get into specifics, but just because it says, you know, up to 500,000, there's a lot of houses that will buy coverage in excess of that. And that's something you could always ask your custodian. Right, for sure. Um, so, yeah, it, it's just, you know, SIPC is there if, if the assets that you hold go quote unquote missing, uh, whatever that means. But I think the good example is Lehman Brothers that they didn't double. Perfect. It's a perfect they example. They didn't double dip and try to plug their holes in their investment bank with customer funds on their brokerage side. Yeah, right? well said, well said. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like what it sounds like what happened at uh, FTX is they were trying to patch holes in different areas and they were 
actually taking, from taking customers, yeah. customers, uh, yeah. customers money. Yeah, so. it's important that you select a good custodian. But the problem with that is that SIPC doesn't apply to cryptocurrencies, I don't think, right now. So I don't think so. Yeah, it's brutal. Uh, last thing I had was a tweet from uh, George Marutis, and I, this was just an interesting one for me, Matt. And he tweeted uh, this picture uh, or this graph that General put up on the YouTube uh, video and our show notes, and it's the price changes of consumer goods and services going back to 2000. I think we've talked about this maybe a little bit before. Um, but my biggest takeaway from this, Matt, is that if you're someone that's concerned about possibly running out of money in retirement, keep yourself healthy. You because well since 2000, uh, hospital services are up over 200% in terms of pricing. Medical care services up almost 150% since uh, the early 2000s. So I think my biggest piece of advice here is make sure that you're doing everything you can to keep yourself healthy and you shouldn't have too much of an issue. Yeah, it's crazy that just the, um, in the healthcare area in general, the inflation rate, um, set aside what's, what's occurred the last 12, 18 months, my goodness, it's been insane the last couple of decades. Right, and I think the interesting one is the, the consumer good that has, the pricing has come in the most or come down or dropped is televisions. Think innovation. Yeah. Innovation and, and I mean TVs have just gotten better since yeah. the two the two thousands the early two thousands right I think uh, you've even argued on down. this podcast before within the last six months I vividly remember that if you look at one of the deflationary factors the last couple of decades it's it innovation. is innovation yeah for sure yeah becoming uh, more efficient at making things yeah um, allows these these prices to drop and similar with cell phone services cell phone services is much more of a commodity now. Um, so it's not a only something for uh, wealthy people, right? Correct. So that makes sense that cell phone services have come down. Uh, obviously, software, toys, that's interesting. Um, so yeah, just thought that it was an interesting graphic if people want to see the- problem with toys coming down is they make them cheaper and yeah. they break a lot, of, a lot quicker. <laughs> that's true. Spoken from a true parent here. <laughs> coming in from overseas, I won't mention where. I'll transition to you to talk about Mr. Diamond. Yeah, my first piece is about uh, Jamie Diamond. For those that don't know, he is the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, the bank. He had a letter to shareholders uh, recently, and I'm going to take kind of a snippet of that letter uh, and share a couple of things because it falls in line with my theme of the market climbing a wall of worry. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to quote what he says here, quote, this is nothing uh, like 2008. While the current crisis has exposed some weaknesses in the system, it should not be considered, as I pointed out, anything like we had experienced in 2008. Nonetheless, we do have other unique and comp complicated issues in front of us, which are outlined in the chart below. Jenna will put this chart up for our YouTube viewers. This will be in our notes, um, our show notes for our traditional podcast listeners. And I would like to just read some of these things off that he has pointed to that the market has been and or is concerned about right now. And remember, listeners and viewers, if there was nothing to be concerned about, all the money would be in the market, everything would be perfectly priced, and there'd be no opportunity for return. Mm -hmm. Market has to climb a wall of worry. Correct. So let's talk about what some of those worries are. I think Jamie Dimon did an okay job here. Ready? Abnormal QT, that'd be quantitative tightening in fiscal spending. So consumer excess savings close to zero by year end, large quantitative tightening, and other unknowns reducing liquidity and triggering higher long-term interest rates, higher fiscal spending, higher climate spending, lingering effects of fiscal stimulus, possible persistent inflation requiring higher interest rates, maybe no end in sight. Next title is war, energy crisis, trade, China, unpredictable war, energy and food crisis averted for now, disproportionate suffering imposed on poor people and nations, inflationary trade adjustments, economic alliances in flux, Potential for rising oil and gas prices, huge economic and geopolitical strains. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It's just, just reading this, it doesn't seem like anything we haven't gone through over the past 20 years. 
even longer. Yeah, even even longer. You know, one, one is they're not geopolitical strains. Yes. So he had on the left side here and now still a good economy. So I'm going to give you the silver lining. Not all doom and gloom. Healthy consumer, healthy jobs, higher wages, good credit, home values up over the last 10 years, recovering supply chain, normalize interest rates, healthy business. Just want to throw it out there. The market's always going to provide you reasons to not like it. Yeah, and again, there's always going to be a reason to sell, right? There's never going to be a time where everything is <clears throat> completely calm and there's no worries in the world, right? Yep. It's like that in your personal life, too. Yeah. You know, not everything's always going to be 100% perfect. Yeah. Um, there's always going to be some sort of, you know, quote unquote headwind out there that could cause financial ruin in the markets, right? And remember, how many times does that happen? Yeah. And my, and my saying is remember, it's not trying to time the market, it's time in the market. Mm hmm. No, that's a perfect example of what we're going through right now. My next thing is a check-in on debt levels, okay? And this is a tweet by Mike Zaccardi on April 5th. Jenna will put up this chart for our YouTube viewers. This will be in our show notes for our traditional podcast listeners. You're gonna, three, you're gonna see three charts here, Mark. The first one on the left is corporate debt levels. And what this is is S&P 500 net debt to EBITDA. And what do you see on this chart from 2001 up to recently in 2023. It's steadily fallen. Shocker. Balance sheets, corporate balance sheets have improved the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Let's look at the next one. Household debt. Household debt as a percentage of GDP. What do you see on this one, Mark? It's been steadily falling. Wow. Okay. Two for two. What's the next one? We got U.S. government debt <laughs> as a percentage of GDP. What do you see on this bad boy? Uh, it's going in the other direction than the first two. From the bottom left to the upper right, steady rise in government debt. So what you see is you see, I need my beverage. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> I need my beverage this morning. So um, corporate debt looking better. Thanks, Nicole. We got need household some, debt. Some caffeine in our lives. Yes. Corporate debt looking better, household debt looking better, public debt, that's the issue. And so, um, you know, recently people have, you know, pointed this out to us, right? They've pointed out things such as, hey, you know, I'm really concerned about, you know, the level of where um, American debt stands and the trajectory of it. Yeah. And, you know, we're a little bit over the, the 110%, 120% debt to GDP level. and. We've actually been here before during World War II in the 40s, but my comment is twofold. One, you look at the rest of the developed world. Right now, the average country in Europe is anywhere from about 150 to 170, 150% to 170% debt to GDP. And it gets as far bad as Japan is like around 230% of debt to GDP. So when someone says to me, hey, I don't think that this is sustainable. That's true over the long term. In the short term, it absolutely is. I hate to say it. I hate to be the, the one that says that, but it is when I'm comparing it to the rest of the world. And the fact that the dollar is the, um, it is a reserve currency, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. 55% of every transaction in this world is denominated in dollars. Could that change the next couple of decades? Absolutely. Is it going to change overnight? No. Yeah, and this stuff just, it makes sense to me because we've had, you know, a rising stock market for these time periods that these chart shows. And it makes sense that stocks did well during the majority of this time period because debt levels are falling, corporate balance sheets are stronger. So when people tell me, you know, the gains in the stock market over the past 10 years have all just been, you know, valuation driven. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, earn, yeah, corporate earnings. debt levels are down. Earnings, earnings are up. have been up. Innovation has been up. So it makes Profit sense margins. why stocks have done so well. You know, I'm, I'm going to call someone out in the podcast. I usually don't do this. 
Jeremy Grantham was pounding the table in the late 2000s about peak profit margins. He could not have been more wrong. Profit margins have continued to go up. And you know what I'm starting to hear right now? We're in another cycle of peak profit margins. Might that be true over the next couple of years? Yeah, it might be true. But I'll throw this out there. What did you talk about innovation just a couple of minutes ago? We're going to have more innovation. We're going to have more productivity gains. Corporate America is great at squeezing out productivity gains and maximizing profit margins. Mm -hmm. So I've been hearing the profit margin peak. I've been hearing these, these same types of things. And you look at history, the chart goes over a long period of time from the left-hand side to the right-hand side higher all over an extended period of time, right? Mm -hmm. No, that's right. So I think it's... It it's a good way to just kind of back away from things for a little bit because when you're looking at debt levels, you, in my opinion, you always have to look at it relative to something else. You can't just say debt levels in general, right? Yeah. Because if you're looking at just like U.S. debt, well, it's like, okay, well, you know, the population has grown over time, so obviously there's going to be more debt in this country, so that number doesn't do anything for me. Inflation. It has to be relative to something else. Inflation. Right. All right, so here's my next piece. My last piece is Fed funds rate in relation to core PCE. So to take a second, I'm just going to explain that PCE is Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index. This PCE price index is released each month in the Personal Income and Outlays Report. And it reflects changes in prices of goods and services purchased by consumers in the US. With that being said, this piece is from Charlie Bellello on April 7th. And so Jenna will put this chart up for our YouTube viewers, be in our notes for our traditional podcast listeners. And I'm going to quote what Charlie says first. Quote, with Fed funds rate firmly above core PCE, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, the Fed seems to have room to pause if they choose at the May meeting, end quote. For the record, as of April 7th, the markets are pricing in a 25 basis point rate hike by the Fed at that next meeting. Now, when you look at this chart, and I'll say it again, you now have Fed funds rate, which is the rate that they charge banks to borrow money from the Federal Reserve, is now higher than the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, okay? So you talked about inflation a little bit ago at the top of the podcast. What do we think happen if inflation continues to come down? What do you think is going to happen the second half of this year? It's likely the Fed's going to have cover to lower interest rates. This is not being talked about enough in mainstream media, in my opinion. So, you know, one thing I want to throw out there is don't be surprised if the economy is sluggish second half of the year, and don't be surprised if you see an interest rate cut at least once, maybe twice. Who knows, maybe more. Right. Yeah, I think it's, you know, we're just in this space now where it's an abnormal environment if the Fed's doing nothing, <laughs> right? It's like this yo-yo that goes back and forth between raising and cutting and raising and cutting, and I just don't know if we're ever, I mean, in the foreseeable future, get out of that environment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still in this camp. I think Powell's going to do the best he can to navigate a soft landing. I think he's, he's, he's trying. And I'm not saying it is um, impossible, but it's definitely going to be a challenge to do the, raise the interest rates to the magnitude they have without causing a recession. And you got to remember, these interest rate hikes is like putting medicine in a patient and the medicine doesn't um, act in the patient instantaneously. It has a de delayed release, delayed reaction. And I think that's why the Fed, I think at some point in the near future here, is going to pause, kind of see how that medicine's working. And if the medicine starts getting a little too strong for the patient, they're going to counteract that by starting to lower. Right. And that might be confusing to some people in a couple of months because the Fed could be cutting rates and, you know, uh, unemployment increases and everyone's like they're cutting rates why are things getting bad it's like okay this this data in our economy is lagging yes and these decisions that the fed makes and that others make 
uh, in positions of power has a lagging effect. Yes. So we're not going to see the ramifications of yes. what the Fed has been doing over the past year f until we're there. <laughs> it could be two months. It could be six months. It could be two years. No one knows. That's right. So again, uh, I'll say it again, debate second half of the year, it's going to be how long does the Fed pause for? When do they start to lower rates? You know, you heard it here first. That's going to be Wall Street's debate the second half of the year. I feel very strongly about that. Yeah. Um, before we go to the financial planning topic of the week, let's uh, recap briefly about the Masters. You had some predictions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, predictions were not great for the most part. I think uh, Jordan Spieth came in third or fourth. So that was, uh, I picked him to win. Rory McIlroy missed the cut. Uh, happy to see John Rahm win, though. He's a really, he seems like a really good Personally, guy. Personally, I think he Best did a pretty darn good job, actually. Yeah. There's a lot of, how many total players entered the Masters tournament? Oh, man. Uh, probably between 70 and 90. I think he did just fine. So 50 think, make the cut? I think he did just fine. <laughs> so uh, disappointing to see Tiger withdraw. Uh, it was pretty sad to watch him limping around with his plantar fasciitis. The weather was crazy. Uh, it was 85 on Thursday, then f like 46 on Saturday. My guess is though, playing the, in the rain, the wetness uh, probably made walking for him even harder. Yeah, yeah. So because the, 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 uh, one of the days, I think the course was just drenched. Yeah, it was. It was, and they have a really good draining draining system there. But I mean, if you get that much rain, the course is going to be soaked anywhere. But um, yeah, it was uh, had a lot of drama in it. It was a PGA guy against a live guy all the way to the end, uh, which I think is probably what most people wanted because people are arguing that the live guys can't keep up anymore. And obviously Kapka did for three rounds and then John Rahm took over after that. But uh, I was I was happy with it. I thought it was a really good weekend. I would agree. And I enjoy watching it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, I'll let you go. I'm going to bring Taylor in for uh, the financial planning topic of the week. Um, and Taylor this week is going to talk about uh, average 401k plan balances uh, by certain ages and a couple other items with that. So thanks for coming in, Taylor. Yeah, no problem. So I wanted to talk about this because I feel like we do get lots of questions where people are like, how am I doing compared to other people my age? Right. But there's so many variables that affect that. So yeah. I just wanted to, to touch on it. Okay. So um, the article I read, it's by John Doolin, and it started out by saying, saving for your retirement dream is something on most people's minds, and some people have a rough idea of how much money they need to fund retirement, while others may have a more specific number. While this is great, the problem is, how do you know if you're on track to reach your retirement savings goals? Many people turn to comparisons, then try to see how others their age are doing to determine if they are on track with their retirement planning. While that's better than nothing, comparing the average 401k balance by age is not the smartest. Um, and I think that's true because it really doesn't give you an accurate idea of if you're on track. You really need to look at what your retirement expenses may be like. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to estimate, especially if it's really far down the line. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the most common question that we get. And we've talked about it on here a lot is, you know, how much do I need to retire? Right. Mm -hmm. Or if we're working with 401k participants, how much do I need in my 401k for me to stop working? And it's like, OK, it's a loaded question and it's not the same for everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we can tell them what our recommended withdrawal rate is. Um, but, you know, if, if they want fifty thousand dollars in income in retirement my argument is they have to have at least a million dollars in their 401k or their ira if they want to take that every single year um so it really depends like you said on what the need is but your need isn't going to be the same as your neighbor's need or mm -hmm. the same of as your brother's need or your parents need so you can't uh compare and try to keep up with the joneses just because your neighbor has a higher 401k balance doesn't necessarily mean you need to have the same 401k balance, right? Right. Yeah, because, I mean, there are some people who retire completely debt-free, and so their expenses are virtually minimal. Right. They may not need more than a million dollars. Right. So it's just different for everybody. Um, so the data I'm about to read off comes from Fidelity and Vanguard. They're some of the two biggest retirement plan providers for 401ks. 
Um, now, I know this data did come out in 2022. I'm not sure how large the pool was, but this kind of gives us an idea. So if you're under 25, the average 401k balance is around $6,700. If you're between 25 and 34, the average is around 33,000. If you're between age 35 and 44, that average goes up to around 86,000. Ages 45 through 54, jumps up to around 161,000. 55 through 64 jumps up to about 232,000. And then if you're over the age of 65, the average balance was around 255,000. So pretty low numbers, but not too surprising. Yeah, not too surprising. And, and it also, I think this doesn't tell the whole story too, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, for let's just take the over 65 crowd. Those people are more likely to uh, have pension income than people that are mm -hmm. in their 30s or their 40s because pensions were a big retirement benefit um, that corporate America offered back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, they have since um, stopped that benefit for the most part, but um, these people have other forms of income, right? Mm -hmm. um, they have spouses that could have 401ks or pension income. Uh, they're most likely taking or getting ready to start taking Social Security, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe 255 for a lot of people in their 401k is enough, but I'm sure on the other side of the coin, there's a lot of people out there in America that, that don't have enough to retire when they want to retire. And mm -hmm. this is, is a pretty good example of that. And I think it's better to... You know, when you start working and you come into the workforce, just be like, OK, I'm going to save 15 percent of my pay or 20 percent of my pay at, right off the bat. Not going to touch it. I'm going to do that for the rest of my life or increase it by one percent per year. Mm -hmm. That's a better way to approach it, because that way you're not going to know the difference between missing that money that you're making or not. Right. Exactly. And then obviously with inflation, with cost of living adjustments, with raises, with bonuses, you know, you'll be able to increase your what I call your lavish, lavish spending as well, um, or your discretionary spending. But um, starting off is, is so important to start off saving a good number because you just never miss it going forward. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. And if you slowly increase that contribution right over time, you know, like you were saying once a year or maybe every time you get a bonus, you're not really going to notice, mm -hmm. you know, that that percentage could jump up quite a bit over time. Right. Um, next, I just want to go over some different variables that really affect 401k balances. Um, and this is why you really can't compare yours to others. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the most basic ones are different income, different employer matches. Um, I've seen some employer matches that are up to 9%, and then I've seen as low as a quarter of a percent. Mm -hmm. um, some people don't even match, but... Right that makes a huge difference. Um, it also depends when you start saving, because if you start when you're 20 versus somebody who starts when they're 40, you're probably going to have significantly more um, in the 401k. Yeah. And there's, been, I mean, there's been so many articles and, you know, media clips out there of the importance of starting early. You can just go to Google and type in retirement savings calculator mm -hmm. and grow money over a 20 year period and grow it over a 40 year period. And it is a significant, significant difference. And in my opinion, that's the biggest factor is, you know, the starting date and how much you're saving. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing in the world. Yeah. That matters. I mean, it could make hundreds of thousands it's of dollars. If not millions. More, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a couple other variables that really affect 401k balances. Um, one is profit sharing plans, because not every 401k has those, but they make a huge difference. Yeah. So essentially what that is, is some employers have a profit sharing plan where if they hit their quotas, they might pay out a certain percentage of that profit to an employee's 401k. Right. Um, and they can be very large. Absolutely. And, and what I've found, Taylor, and I'm sure you found the same thing, is that typically companies that have generous profit sharing plans, their employee matches to the 401k is a lot lower. Mm -hmm. And for someone that's never worked at a company that does profit sharing, they just come into this company and see, oh my gosh, they only match 
a half a percent up to 2% of my pay, that's horrible, mm -hmm. right? But they don't understand that, hey, if the company meets its financial metrics for the year, you could get upwards of 20, 30, 40% of your pay put into your 401k in the, mm -hmm. in, in the form of profit sharing. If right. you stay under the limits and the rest of it's paid out to you as cash. So it right. is a pretty good benefit. Yeah, right. for sure. A um, couple other things, you know, maybe someone's focusing on paying off debt versus saving for retirement. Um, and you mentioned this earlier, maybe one spouse stays at home and the other one is working. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they can't contribute maybe as much as someone else. Um, people take out 401k loans, which has a significant impact on the growth of the account. Um, and then also people have, well, some people do have multiple retirement accounts. So they might be divvying up their money across different areas. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because you can, you know, you can have a 401k, you can have an IRA, you can have a Roth 401k, a Roth IRA, you can have a taxable individual account, taxable joint account. So many. So many yeah. different ways to, to save, right? So this is just looking at, you know, one aspect of it, but it is just, you know, important to note with the 401k, um, you know, th back in the day, 20, 30, 40 years ago, the onus was on the employer to set up some sort of retirement benefits for their employee. But really in the early to mid 2000s, that changed to where the onus is on the employee mm -hmm. to save and set themselves up for retirement because uh, corporate profits uh, became much more in focus. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately for for a lot of people it's it's up to us to save her own financial futures and mm -hmm. uh, the 401k is a great vehicle to do that but don't think that that's the only way that you have especially if yeah. you don't work for a, a company that has a 401k a lot of small businesses don't have a 401k sometimes they don't even have a retirement plan so sometimes you have to do that stuff on your own and it's just important to educate yourself on the best way to do it yeah you can't really rely on on one account one employer plan um, so I think, you know, the biggest takeaway is don't compare your performance to somebody else's. Look at maybe what your retirement expenses will be like. Try to estimate that. And that's a good starting point for if you're on track. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, we're just in this constant uh, environment of, you know, comparing and trying to keep up with people. And, and financials is one place not to do that. Right? No, it can cause so, a lot of problems. Yeah, it definitely could. <laughs> Well, thanks for uh, jumping in and talking a little bit about savings and 401ks, Taylor. Uh, we will be back with everybody next week for episode number 197 of the Independent Advisors podcast. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week and a great weekend. Thank you for listening to the Independent Advisors podcast. If you're interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button so you can be notified every time a new episode gets released. Feel free to share with friends, family, and follow us on Twitter at Jessup Wealth, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mark and Matt will continue to share beneficial information on these social media sites. Also, check out the podcast tab on their website. That's www.jessupwealthmanagement.com. There you'll find links to every episode of the Independent Advisors. Have questions or topics you want to discuss on the show? Message us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or send an email with the words questions and topics in the subject line to inquiries at jessupwealthmanagement.com. We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. Certain sections of this commentary may contain forward-looking statements based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. All indices are unmanaged and are not available for direct investment by the public. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and does not constitute either tax, legal, or financial advice. Although we do go to great lengths to make sure our information is accurate and useful, we recommend you consult a tax preparer, professional tax advisor, financial advisor, or lawyer regarding your specific circumstances. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. No strategy can guarantee any objective or goal will be achieved.